seems a little strange to follow that up with this scripture about uh, women being silent and asking their husbands at home. Uh, this is a scripture that is part of our series today about women in the Bible and specifically Paul and women and how he interacted with them and what he taught. Now, a lot has been debated and written over the years regarding the Apostle Paul. Some Christians really like Paul, and they like to spend a lot of their time in his letters. Other Christians are uncomfortable with some of what Paul says, and so they sometimes prefer to ignore these certain hard teachings and maybe focus on the Gospels. I think it's safe to say that since Paul's death, his letters and work have been scrutinized and debated ever since. Now, one of the foremost of those debates is the role of women in the church, and of course, there are many perspectives that exist. There are three main scriptures attributed to Paul that have been interpreted as a prohibition against women taking certain leadership roles in the church. Titus 2, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy 2. Today I've chosen to focus on 1 Corinthians 14, and by natural extension, we'll also be talking about 1 Corinthians 11, which has some things to say too, and these two scriptures kind of interplay on each other in an interesting way. I also want to note of the three biblical commentaries I studied, I was introduced to three different ideas of what each author thought this scripture meant, which means that even among those who have devoted their lives to ancient Greek and the reading of the New Testament, there are a variety of opinions. But nevertheless, I'll do my best to give a brief overview of Paul and some of the women he worked with, and then we'll dive into 1 Corinthians 14. But of course, first we have to begin with Jesus. Now, I think it was already four weeks ago, it was the last time I uh, spoke on uh, this series, I gave a sermon on the role of women in the Old Testament, and then in the intertestamental time, the time between the Old and New Testament, and then also how Jesus uh, incorporated them in his ministry. How it moved from a somewhat closed or moderate perspective in the Old Testament to a very closed society uh, during the day of Jesus, but then Jesus does some very different things. And I also shared a few stories about how Jesus uh, interacted and uh, maybe did some very radical things. One of those stories was Mary and Martha, the story of how Mary leaves the kitchen to help Martha making the food, she leaves the kitchen, which was the woman's domain in the first century Judaism, and she goes and she sits at the feet of Jesus with the men, thus declaring herself a disciple of Jesus, which only men could be at that time, and declaring her intention to also become a rabbi, as all disciples of rabbis did when they sat at their rabbi's feet. And Jesus says to her, she is chosen rightly, and it will not be taken away from her. I also briefly touched on the story of how Jesus chose Mary Magdalene to be the first person to see him after his resurrection, and how Jesus commissioned her to bring the good news of his life to his disciples. Mary is the first person in the Bible to speak the gospel of Jesus to another person, a woman to some men, and they don't believe her. In that sermon, we also looked at how Jesus radically included women among his friends, as his disciples and how his ministry was often funded by these women. His ministry was radical compared to other rabbis of his day and set a very different tone for the early church when compared to first century Judaism. Not long after the resurrection, however, Jesus ascends to heaven and a brand new age dawns, the age of the Holy Spirit. And so that's where our passage takes us today. By the way, this is probably going to sound a little more like a lecture than a sermon, and I'm sorry about that. It's just a lot easier for me to present. So, the book of Acts. Now, the first real indication we have that women are participating in non-traditional ways in the church comes at the Pentecost experience, when, after the Spirit is poured out on 120 men and women gathered in the upper room, these men and women burst out into the streets, speaking in the languages of the pilgrims in Jerusalem that day, and later, Peter explains in his sermon to the Jews that Joel's prophecy that men and women would prophesy in the last days has finally come. The next major indication that women's role in the church had been elevated comes in an unexpected place, and that is in Saul's persecution of the Christians. In Acts 8, verses 1 through 3, we see that Paul is persecuting 
not just men, but also women in the new church. And in Acts 9, 1 through 3, Saul goes to the authorities to get letters, granting him permission to imprison both men and women of the church. Now, what's striking about this is that his persecution of women indicates that they were seen as leaders in the church. In Middle Eastern culture, it was, and still is today, a patriarchal society, where in times of conflict, it is the men who are targeted because they carry the natural leadership role, while women and children are largely left alone. American theologian Ken Bailey, who lived in Lebanon during the 17-year civil war in the 1970s and 80s, writes about how men were rarely seen in the market streets unless they were accompanied by armed guards and were wearing bulletproof vests. While women and children walked freely in the markets and on the streets, shopping anytime, because they were never targets. We see this in an interesting way in the crucifixion story. When Jesus is arrested, all of his male disciples run away. They were the targets. And when he is crucified, only the women are there, with the exception of the beloved disciple listed in John, which probably gives us a clue to just how young, young the beloved disciple was if he was present without fear. So with this in mind, we realize that something very different is happening in Saul's persecution. Women are also targets. So what does that mean for the kind of leadership they were perceived to be assuming in this new movement? Well, after Saul is converted to Paul, his missionary journey begins to take him into contact with a variety of men and women throughout the Roman world who were both Jews and Greeks, as well as slaves and free people. Now, while the majority of Paul's associates who are named in Scripture are men, there are also a significant number of women who are named who are important leaders in the church. In Acts 16, Paul meets Lydia in Philippi, who the Scriptures say was very wealthy, and also she was the head of her household. And Paul plants a church that begins meeting in her home. In Acts 17, in Berea, a number of prominent women convert, which is our clue that it is probably in their homes that the church begins meeting also. And in Acts 18, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, a husband and wife. He instructs them in the new movement. And these two go on to become quite a force in the early church. Paul speaks of them as his co-workers, as equals in his work for Christ. And they also become the teachers of Apollos, who went on to become one of the great evangelists of the church. Now, while Acts is a wealth of information, we also have a lot of information from Paul's letters, which are often located in the chapters that nobody wants to read because they are extremely boring. For example, Romans 16, which is simply a list of all the people Paul wants to commend to the Romans to listen to or to welcome. It's a list of names. In this particular chapter, we find this list, and there are other lists in Paul's letters. But here Paul speaks, this is on my count, which is probably not accurate. He speaks about 10 women and 27 men. I may be off one or two there. But here in this list of people, Paul again mentions Priscilla and Aquila. But he also mentions Phoebe, who is listed in the Greek language as a diakonos, which is translated a deacon or minister of the church of Kencrea, which is right next to Corinth. She is also quite possibly the one who read the letter of Romans to the Roman church when it first came to that place. We also find a very interesting person named Junia, who is also listed as Julia or Junius. She is listed as a prominent apostle in the church. And she is very interesting because an apostle would have been evangelizing, church planting, preaching and teaching in these churches with authority. Early church father Origen reports that Junia was one of the 72 disciples sent out by Jesus in Luke 10. So these scriptures and numerous others point to women participating in worship, speaking in worship, teaching, prophesying, and holding positions in the church. So if this is true, then what in the world is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 14? Is Paul trying to take a step back and say, wait a minute, this movement is a little out of control. We need to get back to the way things always run. 
or is something else happening here? So with this question in mind, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians seriously, you know then that the Corinthian church had major issues whenever they met for worship and throughout the week. It is almost comical when you read 1 Corinthians because it's hard to imagine a church having so many bizarre problems. There were major divisions in the church, bizarre sexual immorality, there were lawsuits among the members, financial issues, they were arguing over what kind of meat they should eat, and there was even drunkenness during the service, especially the Lord's Supper. And it goes on and on from that. Those are just some of the highlights. Now, of all the issues the church had, our scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 14 deals with issues surrounding worship in Corinth. Now, when a typical early church met, it was for worship, which meant they would pray, there was prophecy, there was speaking in tongues, there was mutual discipling, teaching, singing, and sharing the Lord's Supper. Worship often happened in household churches, uh, so the church at Corinth probably met in three or four locations, but occasionally everyone would gather together uh, for an all-church assembly, which usually meant there was going to be a baptism, or they would read one of Paul's letters to the whole church. So, when we come to 1 Corinthians, uh, we find that Paul addresses worship in chapters 11 through 14. So here are some of the problems and corrections he makes in these four chapters. He begins about speaking about headship, hair, and clothing matters in chapter 11. He goes on to speak about the Lord's Supper and the various problems that were happening when people gathered. Some people were coming early. They ate and drank everything. There was nothing left. Some people were drunk. Some people didn't have anything. That's kind of a problem. It goes on in chapter 12 to, uh, to talk about spiritual gifts and that no one person has all of them, but everybody brings something and builds the body up. Chapter 13, we know this, the more excellent way of love, and, and Paul is talking about how these spiritual gifts are nothing unless we love one another. And then in chapter 14, he comes back to spiritual gifts where he begins to give uh, instructions on how to use these in an orderly fashion. Now, <clears throat> chapter 14, then, our chapter today breaks down into this. Verses 1 through 25, he gives instructions on how to orderly prophesy and speak and interpret tongues. In 26 through 32, he gives instructions for orderly worship. Then in 33 through 36, our passage today, instructions to women, and then ends with, again, doing all things with order. Now, as I was saying, we know that the Corinthian church worship was absolutely chaotic there is evidence throughout the letter that people were standing up and offering very long prayers very loudly. Okay, I've heard that's happened here before, but I won't say who. No, I'm just kidding. I've never heard that. Um, we also know that people were standing and speaking in tongues very loudly in a very unorganized way. People were speaking over each other. We know that nobody was interpreting these tongues, and so nobody knew what anybody was saying. We also know people were prophesying out loud, often prophesying over each other. And as I said before, some people drank all the communion wine, and there were problems with that too. So with all of that combined, you can imagine just how utterly disorganized and chaotic Corinthian worship was. It's the exact opposite of what we're experiencing today, right? So with that in mind, we come to our passage today where Paul writes, For God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only ones it has reached? Okay. What's strange about this passage is that we know for certain that women were speaking and participating freely in worship. Not only do we see this in the book of Acts and other of Paul's writings, but we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And here's what he says in chapter 11. This is the part where he talks about head coverings. 
He writes, any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head, but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. Now, what's important in this passage for today is to recognize that Paul is assuming that women are participating vocally in worship. As he says here, any woman who is praying or prophesying, and then he talks about veiled or unveiled heads. So we see in this small passage that both men and women were praying and prophesying out loud during the service. And it probably also meant they were speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues. Remember, everything Paul deals with in 11 through 14 is public worship. This isn't what you do at home when you pray or prophesy at home. He's talking about chaotic worship problems. So we see that he totally expects women to pray and prophesy out loud, and he gives them ways to do so orderly. So if Paul expects women to pray and prophesy out loud in worship, what in the world does Paul mean in 1 Corinthians 14 that women should be silent? Ken Bailey, who is a senior scholar and professor of Middle Eastern culture, offers some pretty interesting insights into this passage from a cultural perspective. Again, Bailey lived in the Middle East for 30 years, mostly in Lebanon, and during his time abroad, he worshiped in a variety of Christian churches in the Middle East. In churches in the Middle East, and I don't know if it's still like this today, but it was in the 1980s, women sat on one side and men sat on the other. And the service was also held in the proper language. You know, maybe you're familiar with the fact that there's high German and low German. Uh, high German was often spoken in the churches, in our old churches, low German was used in the marketplace. In the Middle East, it was similar. In churches in the Middle East, sermons were given in classical Arabic. The problem was that only men know classical Arabic because it's part of their educational studies as men. Women are not taught classical Arabic, but they simply speak the local dialects or languages of the marketplace. So Bailey often describes such a scene that he witnessed in many churches throughout the Middle East in the 1980s. He said, during the sermon, which was always preached in classical Arabic, the women mostly could not understand what was being said. And after a while, the women on their side would begin to get bored, and they would begin to talk amongst each other. And as the talking among the women would grow, every so often the minister would pause and he would have to say, will the women please be quiet? Well, the women would be quiet for a few minutes, but pretty soon the chatter would begin to start up again, and the minister would pause and say, will the women please be quiet? And then he would say, look, I know you don't understand what I am saying, but please be quiet. When you get home, you can ask your husbands what I was talking about. That makes a lot of sense socially and culturally, right? Remember, Paul is saying in chapter 14 that worship must be orderly without this kind of interrupting chatter from the women's side in the Lebanese churches. But it may not have been simply idle chatter that was happening in Paul's day, but in Paul's day, most women were incredibly uneducated. Maybe they were wanting to learn what was the preacher saying that day. And when questions came up, they were asking their husbands, maybe loudly, or as we see, they may have been prophesying during the sermon and teaching time, and it was becoming a huge disruption. What we do know is that Paul is encouraging the women to be quiet during the teaching time, to ask questions later. Don't interrupt. Not only is it disorderly, but it offends the cultural sensibilities of the day, meaning it is shameful. Now, we practice the same thing today. I've never been interrupted in a sermon except for the occasional baby, which I'm totally used to. But if people have questions or anything like that, they wait till after the service. It just makes for orderly worship. Now, I'm not saying that this is the answer to this passage, but I am saying it is a legitimate possibility we should consider. We know Paul is not saying women should never speak in worship because he assumes they are in 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is giving regulations how they should orderly. So what else does this passage say? Verse 34. Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law says. 
The word subordinate in Greek, hypostaso, which means to yield oneself. Now, whatever Paul is mentioning about the law, I am totally uncertain. There is no law in the Old Testament that ever says a woman should be silent in worship. But uh, to be subordinate or to yield makes sense. He's encouraging the women to yield to a sense of orderly worship. Do not be loud. Don't be asking your husbands what is being saying if you don't know. Oh, wait till the service or wait till you get home. Wait till the service is over. And then finally in verse 36 is a rhetorical question that happens, appears to be directed to the disorder caused by interruptions of women that even though women deserve to know what is being preached, that doesn't give them the right or authority to interrupt causing a chaotic worship service. So with all of those things in mind, uh, let's read this passage again. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only ones it has reached? Paul demands that the Corinthians stop their chaotic worship and instead strive for an ordered and respectful worship service. He says in other places, if there's going to be prophecy, please, just two or three prophets stand and speak. Or if anyone's going to speak in tongues, just two or three stand and speak. And if you're going to, make sure someone interprets. Otherwise, don't do it at all. When the teaching or the sermon time is happening, please be quiet and ask questions after the service or at home. Don't interrupt so much. And for goodness sake, Save the wine and the bread so that everyone can have some and nobody is causing a disturbance. This command to figure things out at home makes sense and is consistent with Paul or in other places. In chapter 11, Paul encourages people to eat at home before they come to the Lord's Supper so that there's enough for everybody. Again, take care of things at home. Don't interrupt worship. And in Acts 18, we have the story of Apollos, how he comes to the synagogue to preach in Ephesus. He preaches about Jesus, but his theology is incomplete. Priscilla and Aquila are sitting there listening, but they don't interrupt his sermon. After the service, they invite him to their house, and Priscilla and Aquila teach Apollos what is true. It's shameful to interrupt worship. Take your issues and questions home. Figure things out there. Worship isn't the time for that. God is not a God of disorder but of peace. I have to think, every time I watch the news on TV and my kids are watching with me, how many times I'm interrupted because they don't understand what is being said. I said, wait till the commercials come and I'll tell you. But if you interrupt me now, I won't hear what they're saying. Women played a critical role in the life of the early church. Hopefully we've seen that in this very quick kind of summary today. I want to recognize that I have not addressed 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 11 or even Titus. Each of those deserves its own separate look. But try to show today that the broader story of Jesus matters. The broader story of Paul matters. And when we take these things into account, these difficult passages that sometimes seem to contradict other things actually just might reveal some surprises we didn't expect. Well, in, this, in the name of orderly worship, it's time for me to end. I'm hoping that you didn't fall asleep, that you didn't talk among yourselves. Thank you. Thank you for not interrupting. And p- please feel free to ask questions or offer different perspectives after worship. All right, let's pray together. God, we give thanks that we can come and we can celebrate uh, what you have done for us and the entire world through your crucifixion, your resurrection, and the way that you've taught us to live, that we might do so orderly and at peace with one another. We pray, Lord, that we might continue to read the scriptures together, to try to wrestle and understand together, that you might reveal all things through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in your name. Amen.